first year anniversary. The podcast officially launched on October 11th of 2019, last year, and our first guest on the show was Andy Abrahams Wilson for the upcoming film called Dog War, which will be covering the dog meat farms in South Korea. And uh, today we have published full uh, 17 full-length episodes on the show, and done, I've done more than 25 interviews uh, on the topic of the dog cat meat trade in Asia. So I wanted to take some time to cover some of our guests to date and what they brought to the table in terms of information. And also I'll be previewing some upcoming guests on the show. And But most importantly, I want to get your feedback. So I'm hoping that you guys will uh, comment in the, the post below and the description below and just share with me your ideas, uh, suggestions for future guests on the show and a bunch more, like I've um, recently included a new feature on the podcast where I take viewers' questions, and I think that's a great way to interact because this podcast has nothing to do with me. I'm just the one who decided to create it because there was nothing like it out there, and I was looking for information. So the whole goal of the podcast is educational. Uh, that's my mandate, it's to learn about the issue and figure out what we can do because I'm in Canada. A lot of uh, the people fighting this cause are Westerners and the US and Europe and uh, we need to know how we can best help the cause and help be most effective. So through my guests I've always asked, you know, recurring questions are, you know, what can we do? from over here to help the cause over there. Um, also learning about the different dynamics, uh, depending on the country. Uh, and also just, you know, sharing strategies, uh, best ways to help. So I wanted to highlight some of our guests to date. Uh, so like I said at the beginning, we have had uh, 17 full length episodes published. Our first show was on uh, the film Dog War. And then the second show was uh, one of the protagonists in the film Dog War, which is um, John, who was John. Uh, he came on the show. He's a former combat vet. And he uh, brought to light a lot of the stuff that I didn't, was not aware of. They've been working. He's been in South Korea multiple times. He's well versed on what's going on and what are the actual victories in terms of, you know, banning the trade versus, you know, some stories we heard, like for example, Seoul in 2019, in October of 2019, they declared themselves to be dog slaughter free. A lot of people understood that to be dog meat free, but it's not the case. They just basically moved out some of the slaughterhouses, the big markets, um, further out in more remote areas uh, to improve their image, international image and to make Seoul a more tourist-friendly destination. Uh, so he was the one to highlight that. And uh, we talked about the Moran meat market and the Gupo mar meat market closures. So super interesting episode. Then I had the pleasure of speaking with James Chai of Arf Arf Bark Bark Foundation. Basically, he is in uh, set up in Vancouver. Uh, he is basically a dog uh, whisperer, if you will. Uh, he's a dog trainer. I had him on the show primarily to discuss the petition that he started. He started the petition to ban dog and cat meat in Canada because, believe it or not, it's legal. Uh, anyone can pretty much slaughter their own dog or cat and eat it. There's no law against it. And so we obviously want to... Um, echo what was done in the States, in the US. Uh, so many dog uh, cat meat trade activists worked super hard to get, to get HR 6720 uh, passed. And so it is now illegal in the US to consume and slaughter dogs and cats. So that was a huge victory. Uh, so that was our third show with James Chai. Then we had the pleasure of speaking with Suki Su and Dr. Barbara Jennifer Gitlis for Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation, but also the China Shelter, because Animal Hope and Wellness established a uh, full shelter in China. And it's headed by Suki Su, 
who's a native Chinese and who had reached out uh, back in, I think in 2016. Uh, to Mark Chang, she wanted to help. She had never heard that there was a dog meat trade in her own country. Uh, and so that was super interesting to hear it from her perspective, from a native Chinese. Uh, so it's not as prevalent as we may think because she was born and raised in China. She had never heard of the Yunlin Dog Meat Festival until she moved overseas to study and she heard it on a BBC documentary. So, I mean, it just goes to show that it's still a fringe of the population that consumes dog meat, but um, given their population size, I mean, it still gives way to huge numbers in China with over 10 million dogs being slaughtered every year and 4 million cats. Um, so that was a very good episode and it was thanks to Barbara Jennifer Gifless, Dr. Barbara. She was so nice. She offered to um, record the episode while she was visiting Sukisu at, in China. Then we had uh, John Daly on the show. I think we featured his episode in January of 2020. And he was there to talk about Soy Dog Foundation. He's a co-founder of Soy Dog. Many of you know this organization. They are based in Thailand and greatly responsible Soy Dog for eradicating the dog meat trade in their country of Thailand. Uh, so he, they support other organizations in China. They will give funding to help uh, campaigns in Vietnam. And so they are a great uh, foundation and definitely uh, worth uh, looking into. Uh, then we had Dr. John Sessa for Vanderpump Dog Foundation. And of course, that that is an episode that was very dear to my heart. I really wanted to have Vanderpump on the show because it's thanks to Lisa Vanderpump that I heard about the dog meat trade. I heard it uh, when she did a documentary, Road to Yulin. Uh, she's been amazing at uh, shining a spotlight on the cause. Uh, with her you know celebrity status she got the cause exposed to a whole audience that would have not otherwise never heard of the, the situation so that was uh, our sixth episode then we had tina peters come on the show i believe in march early march uh, to talk about uh, she's a uh, vice president at no dogs left behind and she gave us the latest news during the coronavirus outbreak in early march and she was able to say, you know, what's going on, you know, with Jeff. He got, he was actually stuck in China. They confiscated his passport because he refused to leave when they were asking foreigners to leave the country. He couldn't bring himself to leave. He wanted to stay on and help the operations. So that was a very good show. It was gave us a, a better understanding of, you know, the issues um, that the nonprofits, foreign nonprofits are facing uh, when they work in China. Then we had, of course, Rushton Dog Rescue, which is a fantastic charity based in the UK. Uh, it's a mother-daughter team, uh, Cindy and Zoe McNeil. And it was wonderful to speak to them. They are so charismatic, so, you know, genuine. And, you know, they do so much good work. Uh, they, Rushton Dog Rescue has been around for many years. Uh, they started out just helping local strays and abused animals in their own country, quickly moved on to helping um, situations in, across Europe. And of course, you know, they moved on to help the dog meat trade in China. They've done rescues. Uh, you can go visit their website, Western Dog Rescue. They have dogs up for adoption uh, that were rescued from the meat trade. Fantastic uh, organization. Then we had the pleasure of speaking with Jill Robinson of Animals Asia. And she came on the show in April to really give, to clarify the news, because a lot of news was coming out of China. Uh, we heard that Shenzhen, uh, and it's true, Shenzhen is a big city in the south of China. They were the first one after the COVID outbreak that they decided to put a permanent ban on wildlife trade in their city, and also they included a dog cat meat trade. And not just a ban on the sell of dog meat, but it's a ban on the consumption. So it's illegal in uh, Shenzhen to eat dog meat, or, or cat meat for that matter, and also uh, wildlife. So 
that was a fantastic, I mean, that, that is a victory. That's a landmark decision. It's the first time that any city in China would ban such a thing. So fantastic news. And she, she came to clarify that. Obviously, Zhuhai is the second city that banned the dog cat me trained and the wildlife trade. Uh, so those bans came into effect on May 1st of 2020. And as more recently, uh, city of Leishi um, came on board and they also enacted a ban on the dog cat meat trade in their city. Uh, so they're a situation, a situated in Shandong province and um, Zhuhai and Shenzhen are in the Guangdong province, which is a big mecca for dog meat trade. So it's a huge victory. Um, and also to understand a little bit more what the impact would be from the China's Ministry of Agriculture uh, that stated that dogs were officially excluded off uh, the um, post-COVID-19 livestock catalog in China. And so uh, that was a great episode. She was so kind and generous with her time to come and speak with us. Um, then we had Michael Chor, which many of you know, is um, the founder of The Sound of Animals. They are based in Thailand, um, but they do most of their work in Cambodia. Cambodia, as opposed to Thailand, is still a pretty big uh, country for the dog meat trade. Mostly dogs, uh, not so much cats, but they have a lot of dog meats and then it's unfortunate because uh, for for most of them it's a way of living uh, it's a way to earn a living uh, there's a lot of poverty in Cambodia and you know unfortunately some people were taught that this is a way you can you know earn a few bucks uh, and uh, so he came on the show a great organization uh, they have quite a, a wide a fan base and uh, thank God for that because you know they Michael has been uh, the subject of some controversy but uh, I'm glad to say that all that is behind them uh, they were vindicated in the courts recently and so um, fantastic uh, then we had our 11th show was with UK author and founder of Operation Hound Sarah Brownlee she's a UK author and uh, she's the one who actually uh, wrote the article that many of you probably have read. It was published on the World Dog Alliance website, and it's about the history of dog meat in China. And she says it was um, it, it wasn't like cultural tradition that you know brought the dog meat uh, trade in China as we know it today. It was really political perversion. Uh, so she was fascinating and I wanted her to come on the show to discuss her proposal, which is called the Anglosphere Executive Agreement. And um, it would essentially bring together countries, uh, part of the Anglosphere, so UK, Canada, US, uh, Australia, New Zealand, together to try to exercise pressure on countries where there's a prevalent dog meat trade, namely China. Uh, through trade tariffs and, you know, other trade, you know, negotiations. Uh, she said that uh, the Philippines banned the dog meat trade uh, because of pressure from the UK. Uh, Margaret Thatcher, which, who was the Prime Minister of the UK at the time, uh, she visited the Philippines and there was a big controversy because they, they saw dog carcasses in the back in the, in the picture in the news. And so uh, basically she, she demanded that the Philippines ban the dog meat trade uh, or else the UK would basically uh, remove foreign aid. And it worked. It worked. So if it can work. Uh, so then also on the show, which I absolutely want to cover, is the cat meat trade. Cats are often the forgotten victims of this trade. I mean, so much attention is put on dogs and Understandably so, because many countries don't really have so much of a cat meat trade, but they have a dog meat trade. Uh, so we had Lana Roski, who's a fellow Canadian activist. Many of you know her. Uh, and she came on the show. She's the creator of Feline Warriors, which, as far as we know, is the only group on social media that is dedicated to the cat meat trade. Uh, so she has great knowledge and expertise and she was on the show to share that knowledge. So great episode. That was our 12th episode. 
Then, of course, uh, I had no dogs left behind. Uh, so Jeffrey Berry and uh, Tina Peters, they were on the show. And what many of you don't know or realize is that this show was recorded on New Year's Day. So I'm talking about January 1st, 2020. Um, it was hard. We were trying to book the show and Jeff was constantly back and forth to China from from the US to China and finally just decided, listen, I have a few hours before I have to board the plane back to China. So let's do it. And uh, so grateful. I mean, that's a great testimony to how dedicated they are. They spend their New Year's evening with me, <laughs> someone they don't know. Um, so that was a fantastic episode, so much information shared and um, very grateful for their um, guest uh, appearance. So then also I featured Jian Li of Animal Liberation Wave. That was our 14th episode and Animal Liberation Wave is basically Last Chance for Animals, a sister organization in South Korea. Last Chance for Animals, may, many of you know. Uh, they are based in California, they are U.S. Uh, foundation, but uh, they wanted to do something about the dog meat trade and they enlisted Jian Li, who's a young, very bright activist in, um, in South Korea. And she's the one heading this uh, animal liberation wave and they basically work at the legislation, um, legislation side of things, which is the most important because you know, you can rescue as many dogs as you, you can, but it won't spell the end, right? And uh, she shared with us uh, quite a few of her campaigns that she's been doing in South Korea. They are the ones who hosted the world's largest protest on dog meat trade. Uh, that was done in 2018. Uh, simultaneously, they had a protest in South Korea. They had a protest in LA and DC, Washington DC. So it was a mega, mega protest and it made quite a splash. Of course, they had Kim Basinger, the actress, the famous actress speak. Uh, so it made quite the waves, you know, so that was really good. And then of course, uh, our 15th episode was um, something, a subject that's extremely important in this fight against the dog meat trade and dog cat meat trade should be more precise. Uh, and that's adoptions. And so I'm adamant that I want to do more episodes on adoptions. Uh, but we had uh, the pleasure of speaking with Megan Oaksness and, Ter and Carrie Towery, uh, both working at Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation in Sherman Oaks, California. And our episode featured seven dogs that were rescued from the 2017 Yulin Dog Meat Festival. And we're in 2020. So that means these dogs have been at the China shelter for three years, waiting for their forever home. Obviously, COVID-19, we talked about that on the show, how it was creating, you know, obviously some roadblocks uh, for adoptions. But uh, recently, uh, we're now in October, as I think it was a couple of weeks ago, that now flights are able to fly out of China and bring dogs to the U.S. So that's really great news. So I do urge you to look at that episode. It's fantastic. If you're interested in adopting one of those 2017 Yulin dog meat uh, trade survivors or any survivor for that matter, um, all the information is there on that show. I give you all the coordinates, uh, who to reach out to. And uh, the adoption process is not as daunting as I thought. I thought it would take forever <laughs> to get a dog from China. Uh, to the US, but it's not that long under normal circumstances. And also the fees are much lower than I imagined. So a uh, great show. Then of course we had the Kevin Lahee. Kevin Lahee, he's a well-known vegan activist. He has a vegan podcast. Um, and he's been a spokesperson at many, given many lectures over the years. He basically is originally from New York, but he he's been living for many years in Toronto. And I wanted him to come on the show to discuss. He has like uh, quite the experience because in 20, 2010, he went to teach English in South Korea. And soon after he arrived, he realized there was a problem with the dog meat farms. Like he learned about the, the cause. And of course it touched his heart and he 
uh, very quickly uh, started working for CARE um, in South Korea, which CARE, at the time they changed their name, um, but it was Coexistence of Animal Rights on Earth. And so they uh, basically kind of, uh, well, they, they funded a 18th month investigation into the dog meat farms in South Korea. And so Kevin was the one to visit these farms. He, visited hundreds of farms from everything from small scale rogue operators with you know just a few dogs to the large scale industrial dog meat farms uh, with thousands of dogs so he was able to give us a real uh, picture a very accurate picture of what goes on in South Korea and the tr the dynamics of the trade the challenges ahead and banning the trade so that was such a good episode i really urge you guys to check it out and our 17th and most recent episode that posted at the end of september because all episodes usually post on the last friday of the month so every month uh we had jill robinson come back on the show uh and of animals asia and she was um she basically, we covered everything from her early beginnings uh, when she founded Animals Asia and her goal at the time, and it still is the goal, is to end the uh, bear bile farm in, in China and Vietnam. Those are the two main countries where they, they have a prevalent bear bile farm and it's extremely cruel. Uh, so we discussed that on the show. And Animals Asia has pushed and worked so hard over the years that they have a victory on their hands. By 2022, Vietnam has committed to eliminate bear bile farms. So that's amazing. Um, and obviously, we, she came on the show to talk also about the dog meat trade. Animals Asia did a four-year investigation into the dog meat trade in China. And from 2011 to 2015, I believe. Uh, and they have a full length report that's available on their website. I did read that those reports, um, not in details because some of the details are very harsh to read, uh, but it basically highlights the fact that there are no such thing as dog meat farms in China. It's mostly pets, stolen pets and strays. As opposed to South Korea, South Korea is really the only country in the world that systematically breeds and, and farms dogs for their meat. Um, so uh, obviously the dog meat report also talks about the typical profile, the regions, um, you know, the ways that activists back then, you know, even back then before the new changes in China that, that were basically the result of the COVID-19, outbreak so even back then they highlight how activists can help curb the trade help uh, uh, hold the, the dog meat traders accountable um, basically they need permits to transport dogs they need vaccination certificates and none of them have it you know like they they don't go through that trouble because it costs too much and they want the minimum cost maximum profit uh, so they also highlighted in that report that over 300 restaurants were shut down because of activists volunteering, going to the restaurant, demanding to see their certificates. And when the restaurant owner cannot produce them, then they call the authorities in and basically they have, you know, they have to shut down or at least not sell dogs uh, in their restaurant anymore, dog meat. Uh, so fantastic uh, show, uh, not as well watched as I had hoped, so please go check it out. It's an amazing show. Jill Robinson is, has been at this for over 35 years. She's essentially the queen of animal rights in Asia. Uh, she's done so much good work, so I really do think uh, it's well worth the watch. So I wanted to... Uh, also highlight what I've learned. I mean, I don't know about you, but the whole goal of the podcast was educational. So I wanted to learn I, and understand what the issue is. Like, why is dog meat so prevalent in this day and age in 2020? I understand that back then I've learned through some of my guests that, you know, uh, you know, when there was food shortages, you know, post-war, um, 
I guess it makes sense that, you know, people would eat dogs because there are many strains. It was like an easy source of protein. Um, uh, but, you know, like we're not talking about that anymore. Obviously, China is the world's second, second largest economy and many are predicting that it will become the super economy of the world. So, um, you know, times have changed and you would think that their habits was, would also evolve. Um, but you know, a lot of the older generation uh, that is holding on to those beliefs that dog meat can help them, uh, you know, all sorts of mythical beliefs around dog meat, saying it'll keep them cool during the hot summer days, it keeps them somehow warm during the cold winter days. I mean, it's, it sounds ridiculous, but you know, it's been ingrained in their mindset and so they really believe it. Uh, also that it increases virility of men uh, so for all those reasons and also the fact remains that uh, as opposed to us the concept of pet ownership in China is a very very recent one it's only been 10 years about that people are allowed to have a pet and even then in uh, more urban areas there are very big restrictions on the size of the pet the type of dog that you can have you no animal protection laws in China to this day. Um, so Vietnam is also we learned that it's a mecca for the cat meat trade. Even though it was banned in 1998, and Vietnam put a ban on cat meat trade because they wanted to control the the overpopulation of rats and vermin. So it was not the case that they cared suddenly cared about cats. It was just uh, for that purpose. Uh, but the, the ban was only enforced until 2020 of this year, but it didn't make much of a difference because whether or not something is legal, if it's not enforced and it was not enforced, uh, if the authorities are not prepared to enforce those laws, uh, it won't make much of a difference. And uh, I've learned uh, recently that cat meat is actually on the rise in Vietnam, strangely enough. Cat meat, um, they also have all this belief that cat meat will keep them uh, from having arthritic pain, uh, keep them young and agile. Um, so, yeah. Then we have Indonesia. I've learned that this is very much the case in most countries in Asia. It's always strays or stolen pets. And in Indonesia, unfortunately, uh, it's all run by criminal gangs and uh, a lot of people have their pets stolen right in front of them from their backyard at gunpoint often. Uh, so people are very much victims of this trade themselves. It's causing social unrest. And uh, Vietnam, we heard and we've seen uh, reported cases where the public is, is, is exercising vigilante and trying to enact their own justice because the authorities are doing nothing and they have their pets stolen and they're angry and rightfully so but it's causing a lot of violence and it's just uh, very destructive. And obviously Cambodia, um, basically it's a country where a lot of people that are underprivileged will take to the trade and, and do it for to earn a living, essentially. And in Cambodia, I've learned that the most common method for slaughter is really putting dogs in crates and drowning them. So very 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 cruel uh, so as a vegan um, I've been a vegan for many years and I'm often asked like why I'm so focused on ending the dog cat me trade and so well first of all I don't think I should have to defend the reasons I mean it's pretty obvious it's it's the at the extreme end of animal cruelty I mean every stage of the process of dog meat from transportation where dogs are crammed as many as possible in the cage because a dog meat trader will make more money if he can put just one extra dog in there and they will stop at nothing like i said they have no emotional attachment to these animals they will break limbs if they have to to just stuff as many dogs as possible in cages these cages are then transported on trucks for days on end with no food water and the beating sun and sweltering heat many of these dogs will not survive the trip obviously they suffocate they die of heat stroke of many diseases 
Um, it's extremely painful. We've in, even seen some female dogs give birth to puppies in those conditions. And it, it's enough to break anyone's heart. It's absolutely horrific. So that is first and foremost why I'm fighting this. But obviously, any kind of animal advocacy, any kind of animal protection must start with dogs and cats because that's how it works for every, every country in the world. Uh, so as I mentioned before, China has zero animal protection laws. And so if we can just eliminate this category of animals, which, is cons which are considered, dogs and cats are considered companions, and most of the world, they're domesticated pets. Um, so if we could just eliminate that category of animals from slaughter, we'd be that much more far ahead to get, you know, other laws in place to protect animals, farm animals, animal agriculture. I do believe it will have to be eliminated eventually. I mean, our planet is screaming many signs that, you know, it's time for change. Um, I do pray and hope for a vegan world, but that vegan world will not happen unless and until at least the dog meat trade is eliminated. Uh, so that's just a logical first step. And so also I'm fighting this trade because it um, gives way to so much, so many issues. It takes, it gives way to human rabies, which is a huge problem in Asia, and it's a direct link directly linked to the dog meat trade. Um, it gives way to social unrest, like I mentioned before, to violence because all the people heading this trade are all criminals. And I've heard horrific stories uh, from Harbin Slaughterhouse survivors. Most of you know them. Um, basically, they work in Harbin, which is in the north of uh, China, like right across from North Korea. And uh, dog meat traders know that, you know, like people, like especially foreigners are against this and they will taunt them and uh, they go and say, pay for this dog. Like if you don't buy, buy this dog, it's going to the slaughterhouse. And when they said they, they couldn't, you know, um, pay for the dog, they would basically take videos of, the trader would take a video of himself torturing the dogs and sending it to them just as like a painful reminder of what happens when you don't comply. Um, so there's corruption at every stage of this trade and you know, it just has to end. It has to end. It's like, once you hear about this cause, you can't just go back and pretend and unhear it and just move on with your life and, and say, well, there's nothing I can do. We can all do something. And I took it upon myself to do something, uh, anything to help. And that uh, the podcast is a huge reason why I'm doing this. It's to help expose the issue, to help learn what the issue is and, and different countries, different dynamics, how we can best help um, the cause from over here. Because a lot of our listeners and viewers and a lot of people fighting this trade are not living in Asia. So we're often like signing petitions, but is that the best way to help? Some of the best ways you can help, uh, that we can help, is donating. Obviously donating to the right organizations, doing good work. You can verify this, um, but like I said, from my shows and my many interviews, that's, I'm hoping you're inspired by some. If some of them you don't want to give to, but maybe there's another organization that you hear about that you, you do support. Uh, so without donations, none of this work can take place. I mean, these nonprofits are limited to the resources at hand. And, and so if we don't donate, well, they can't do the work and it's going to be all for nothing. Uh, donating, uh, you can volunteer. I'm a volunteer for HSI Canada because it so happens that their emergency shelter that welcomes dogs that have been rescued from dog meat farms in South Korea is in Montreal. So I'm lucky for that. And I've uh, volunteered and it's amazing to see the transformation from the dog from day one to when they are adopted out. It's like some dogs rebound very quickly, some take longer, but I think the resiliency of dogs is pretty phenomenal. Like, I don't think I would rebound that quickly. 
So volunteering is another fantastic way to help. And uh, obviously donations, uh, volunteering, adoptions. Adoptions, which is another key focus of my pockets. I really want to do a lot more uh, episodes on adoptions. It's so important. If these organizations cannot adopt the dogs out while well, they can't rescue more, you know, like you need to have an out. You have to, for it to be sustainable, you have to manage to find these dogs uh, their forever home. That's the whole goal. Uh, why would you rescue a dog from the meat trade if they can't find a home? So adoption is a huge way you can help. And you can also foster if, uh, you know, like foster families are super important in the transition phase. And, you know, sometimes you can't find an adoptive family, but you can find a foster home for the dog. Um, so those are all ways we can help. Obviously, they... Most of them said, you know, sharing uh, videos and the cause, you know, on social media does help. It, it, it does make a point, you know, that we're aware of what's going on and that, you know, the world is objecting to it. Uh, so that does help, you know. So if all, you know, if you don't feel you can donate, can't volunteer for whatever reason, you can definitely share. And do sign the petitions, even the ones that are more or less <laughs> impactful. Uh, I understand because I've signed many petitions myself, even though I, I pretty much know it's not going to have a major impact. But it's just a way of saying, you know, I'm adding my voice to this. I'm saying I'm objecting and it, you know, for n no other reason it brings it to light. The more signatures on a petition, the more it circulates. People get to learn about the cause, so it's it's all good. Um, so progress and victories today. COVID-19 in many ways has been kind of a catalyst for change. We, and Shenzhen and Zhuhai had banned the dog meat trade. Uh, more recently, Leixi in Shandong province of China has banned the dog meat trade. Um, in July, the Indian province of Nagaland uh, banned the import trading and sale of dog meat. Uh, so that was also a victory. Uh, then we had more recently Siem Reap of Cambodia, with had multitude of slaughterhouses, each one drowning up to 120 dogs a day. So multiple slaughterhouses, 120 dogs each a day. Um, so it gives you an idea. Of, it's a popular uh, trade over there. And they came out and they banned the dog meat trade. Uh, I spoke to Dr. Catherine Pollack, which is an upcoming guest on the show of Four Paws International. And they were, um, they were negotiating with the, the Cambodian government. So they came out with this uh, ban, which is fantastic. So we are seeing progress. Uh, yeah, is it going to end overnight? No, it won't. I won't. Uh, every guest has said that. No, we are getting there slowly. Some of our confirmed upcoming guests include Lola Weber of Change for Animals Foundation, which is the t-shirt I'm wearing today. Um, they are a great organization. Lola Weber, most of you probably have heard of her. I mean, she's been at this for many, many years. Um, she was, I don't know if she still is, but she was a director of campaigns uh, for HSI in South Korea. Uh, she started Change for Animals Foundation with Harry Ekman, and I believe there's another one part of the foundation. And they work all over, you know, Southeast Asia, uh, ending the document trade, and other animal rights issues as well. Uh, so she came on the show, we talked a lot about the Indonesia dog meat trade, and so you're going to have to look out for that. I think it'll be the next episode we post in October. So definitely a must watch. I'm going to have, I also will feature Dr. Peter J. Lee. Dr. Peter J. Lee is probably the smartest guy in all of this. He's China's, uh, HSI's China policy specialist. He's also a professor at the University of Houston. Uh, he's an amazing man, so humble, so genuine, and he came on the show and told me, you know, everything I needed to know about China's policies and their politics and, you know, how they're working with the government to try to enact a permanent ban and, 
make headway in terms of animal rights, you know, animal welfare laws. Uh, so fantastic uh, person and a must watch. You know, when I'll be publishing that, it will probably be November or December of this year. Um, so obviously, my biggest goal with doing this video and celebrating one year anniversary is to get your feedback. I really want to hear from you. Uh, like I said before, this is not about me. It's never been about me. It's about the cause. And I want to hear from you. Who do you want to hear from? Like, which guests should I invite next? Um, what questions should I ask? Uh, so the new feature that I have on my show is when, before I interview someone, I'm going to post the person I'm interviewing uh, ahead of time for you guys to post your questions. I want to, you know, get your feedback. Like, what do you want to hear? Like, this person's coming on the podcast. What do you, what questions do you want answers to? And I want this to be much more interactive because, like I said, it's not about me. It's really about the cause. And, you know, I'm doing this on my free personal time. It's taking a lot of my time because I have a full-time job. Um, that's how I pay my bills. But I did this because I thought it would be a worthwhile uh, service to the community uh, so that we can learn and discover ways that we can help. And so are you getting what you want out of this? If not, let me know what's missing. Even a co-host. I would love to have a co-host. I mean, like I said, this takes a lot of my free personal time. Uh, so it would be great if you want to interview, do some of these interviews, we can do that. Like you can pretty much do any interview just directly on Skype. You can record it in Skype. So you don't need to have some fancy equipment. Um, so if you want to be a co-host or host of an entire show, a series of shows, I'm open. I want to hear from it. Like, what do you think? What do you want to hear? Who do you want to hear from? What questions you want answered? I want to hear from you. So please, Post your comments below, um, share, share, subscribe. I don't ask nearly enough. I really don't, but it does make a difference because uh, YouTube, most of you know, it's all based on algorithms and the more views you get, the more subscriptions you have, uh, the higher up on the search results you will be. And so this gives us an opportunity to expose the cause to other people um, and to have the show seen by more people. I mean, the more people know about the cause, the more people can get involved, and the more people can learn, the better. So please do subscribe, like, share, and uh, hopefully we'll make this uh, podcast uh, an even greater tool and resource for our community. And that's uh, my greatest hope. So waiting to hear back from you. Don't be shy. Leave me a comment. If you're really, really shy, you can always private message me. I'm on Facebook. You can find me under Jade Ara. Send me a message. No matter what, I just want to hear from you. And uh, look out for the next episode to post. It will be at the end of October. And it will be featuring Change for Animals Foundation, Lola Weber. Watch out because it's going to be a great show.